Hey, welcome. This is the Venture Out event. This is the Venture Out event for uh, the 7th of July. We are doing technological innovation for soil carbon sequestration today, and this is a conversation with Pluton Bio. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Steele. I am the partnership support on the Accelerate for Impact platform. And just a little bit of a brief description of the session as, as people begin to enter. This Venture Out event today is connecting our scientists with the innovation ecosystem to learn from the latest cutting edge technologies. And we invite founders in the agri-tech space to share their journey of scaling from an idea in a research lab to a multi-million dollar venture. So a brief introduction, I'll go ahead and name the speakers today with us. We have Barry Goldman, founder and chief science officer of Pluton Biosciences and Ajit Govan, Senior Climatologist and Systems Modeler at the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas. During the Q&A portion of this event today, we're gonna encourage everyone in attendance to please submit some thoughtful questions for our speakers. And you can you do that using the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. So we do encourage thoughtful participation. We really want to get the conversation going and we're thrilled to hear what sort of inquiries you have for our speakers today. All right, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with the event. Uh, to introduce myself a bit more, my name is Megan Steele. I'm partnership support on the Accelerate for Impact A4IP team. And this event is brought to you by our team, a venture space that builds on CJR's legacy of research and innovation to support both incremental and transformational innovation to address some of the world's most pressing challenges at the nexus of agriculture, environment, and health. A4IP bridges science and entrepreneurship to incubate and accelerate scientific ventures for spin-offs, such as startups, that directly respond to market demand and generate both impact and resources needed to support continued research in pursuit of the sustainable development goals. The Venture Out event aims to connect our scientists with the innovation ecosystem out there and learn from the latest cutting edge technologies. We do it by inviting founders of successful startups operating in the agri-tech space to share their scaling journey from being a research idea in a lab to becoming a multi-million dollar startup. Through this, we learn and from and connect with disruptive science-based startups and keep nurturing the entrepreneurial mindset, market and impact oriented approach of the organization. And our seminar today is technological innovation for soil carbon sequestration with Pluton Bio. Around one third of the increase of atmospheric CO2 is attributed to soil organic carbon loss. And this is not only a huge threat when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, but declining fertility due to SOC loss risk also great damage to agricultural productivity and thus food security. In the context of the coronavirus pandemic, climate change and food system shocks from the war in Ukraine, we need innovative solutions to problems like SOC loss and we need them fast. Carbon sequestration presents an opportunity to reverse this SOC loss by removing atmospheric CO2 and storing it in the soil carbon pool. These technologies provide a crucial opportunity for negative emissions. Scientific estimates indicate that agricultural soils have the potential to store an additional billion or more tons of carbon per year. Nevertheless, challenges like scientific disagreement over the permanence of storage, fragility of smallholder land rights, and inequity or difficulty of access to measurement technologies present obstacles for scientists and entrepreneurs alike. More collaboration between scientists and ventures can bridge the disconnect to solve some of these issues and strengthen soil carbon sequestration technologies. And that's the goal of this venture out event today. We want to trigger interest and exposure to breakthrough technologies out there and spur market-driven research and collaboration. So as I mentioned up top, joining us today, we are proud to have Dr. Barry Goldman, founder and chief science officer at Pluton Bio. As chief science officer, Dr. Goldman developed scientific strategy for the next generation of microbial discovery at Pluton. Prior to founding, Dr. Goldman led the microbial testing pipeline for Indigo Ag and served as the microbial discovery lead for Monsanto Company. He has published over 30 peer reviewed studies and is an inventor on more than 10 patents. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Botany from the University of Washington and holds a PhD in Microbiology from the University of Utah. And today he'll be presenting on the innovations of Pluton Bio. Pluton quickly and inexpensively taps into the diverse world of bacteria, fungi, and viruses to discover next generation products for carbon sequestration and climate protection, plus agriculture, pharmaceutical, biomaterials, and bioremediation. Pluton Bio C round garnered 6.6 .6 million in funding, and now Pluton Bio is collaborating with Bayer on a soil carbon sequestration product, a micro-based carbon capture soil amendment for growers to be sprayed at planting and harvest. 
This presentation will highlight Pluton Bio's journey to scale and share the lessons learned on overcoming scaling challenges, as well as what's next for collaborative innovation in soil carbon sequestration. Afterward, climatologist Dr. Ajit Govind, a technical expert on soil carbon sequestration from CGIR and ACARDA, will lead the Q&A discussion portion, and we're thrilled to have them here today speaking to all of us. For those of you attending online, this is a great opportunity to learn, to listen, to get inspired, and connect with like-minded peers and innovators. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Goldman, for your presentation on Pluton Bio and technological innovation for soil carbon sequestration. Thank you, Megan. Uh, and thank you for the great introduction and uh, welcome, uh, Ajit. Um, so I'll, I will share my screen here and kind of take about 20 minutes to go through uh, our, our presentation and uh, help you understand what it is we're trying to do. And, and the focus of us as a company, and, and generally when you, when you talk to investors, you have to have a very good focus. You can have the most high-minded things in the world, but at the end of the day, is how are you going to make money? And so one of the things we talk about is how do we turn agriculture into a profitable carbon negative future? Right now, agriculture is responsible for almost 20% of all emissions in the world. And there are two main goals. By the 2050, we need to feed 10 billion people and we need to reverse climate change. And the problem is they are incompatible goals. Agriculture, by its very presence of trying to feed people, increases the amount of CO2 and N2O, major greenhouse gases, increasing the temperature of, of, the, of, the, of the globe. By doing that, it decreases yields, increases in temperature, decrease yields. And so more land and more materials are needed to keep feeding the world and an increasing population. So as a consequence, one is negatively impacting the other. And so we think about this in a, in a very holistic way. How can we as a company solve both of those problems. And we try and do that by, by, by taking and understanding the idea that crops integrate with the soil and the microbes in the soil. It, integra it integrates with the water system and the air, and it has to be protected from, from pests of, of various kinds. And so we're developing systems to solve all three. And we talk, I'll talk today about all three systems, but I'll focus on one uh, in more detail, which is how do we take microbes and put them onto the soil to sequester both CO2 and to fix nitrogen. And the reason we do both is that photosynthesis, the core of sequestering carbon, they run out of nitrogen. Organisms that photosynthesize run out of nitrogen relatively quickly. Nitrogen fixers, which are great at pulling N2 out of the atmosphere and converting it into uh, ammonia and, and glutamine and other, and other reduced forms of nitrogen, do great, but because it takes 16 ATP to, to do that, they run out of energy. By developing consortia that have both of them in there, they can cross feed each other and do better at it. And so that's how we think about uh, what we're trying to do. Now, how we do this is something we call micro mining. And the idea is instead of looking at one microbe at a time, because of the massive increase in sequencing and computational systems, you can now start with populations. So traditionally, and really for hundreds of years, uh, humans have said, let's look at this one interesting organism. We, we isolate it on a plate or we isolate it uh, however we think about it. And we maybe we find a few of them, but that's very slow. There are a trillion species of microbes in the world. And if you look at one at a time, you'll never look through all of them. And we believe inherently in my background as a microbiologist, we were ingrained with the ideas, if you could imagine it, a microbe already does it. If you can imagine microbes pulling CO2 and fixing climate change by pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, improving soil health by pulling N2 out of the atmosphere and, and replacing synthetic fertilizer, microbes are already doing that. And just how do we get there quickly? And so we look at microbial populations to identify those microbes that do what we want them to do. And then like computer sequencing, and, and, and massive sequencing computer analysis identify what did the work. Okay, so let me talk about our first product, which is for carbon and nitrogen capture to improve soil health. Now we call these microbial cover crops. So MCCs or microbial cover crops. And the idea is to take C, is to have these microbes and just put them onto the soil. And they take CO2 through photosynthesis and they take N2 through nitrogen fixation 
And then they take and reduce that, integrate that into biomass, as well as other long-lived carbon molecules, and they just put that in the soil. So they function by growing. You put them on the soil, and they increase their biomass, you know, a thousand X in the soil. And by doing that, they pulled CO2 out of the atmosphere. In doing this, you're enriching the soil. It's kind of the basis of what we think about regenerative ag and, and sequestering carbon. But the most important thing that has to be done is we need to figure out a way for farmers, for growers to increase their income. If we don't do that, if we don't figure out a way for a grower to adopt the technology, it doesn't matter. So we are really focused on trying to figure out ways for a farmer to make more money, right? So let me talk about that in a little more detail and, and why this has more value. So plant cover crops, I'm sure you've heard of these, they've been around for literally hundreds of years <clears throat> and they're, they're growing and it's a critical part of regenerative ag. Plant cover crops are great. You know, the, you, you get a, a, a group of, uh, of plants, you know, maybe uh, oats and, and legumes and whatever you put it into the field. Well, the problem is that you need to run the tractor over the field to plant them. And then when the plants are done, you actually need to get rid of them because they become weeds. And so, and then it's, they're very cost, uh, cost intensive. It's $40 an acre just to just to buy the stuff. And then you got, each time you run a tractor over the field, that's eight to $10. Then you got to get rid of them. You got to burn them down. It's high, high, it's, it's very time intensive. And so it's not very convenient. So we said, well, why don't we do something a little bit different? If we put the microbes out there, they do most of the stuff that a plant cover crop does, not everything, but most of it, particularly pulling out carbon and nitrogen. And then once you put it on the surface, you're done. It's already done what it has to do. And it works by growing, by essentially pulling out, growing in sunlight and pulling CO2 into out of the atmosphere and, and put it into the soil. And so that's how we think about it. Now, the other thing with plant cover crops, I mean, if, if it was cost effective, people would do it, but it's only 5% market penetration. In the US, that's 300 million acres of row crops, but only 15 million acres use plant cover crops. And it's because farmers lose money on it. Okay, so let's, let's talk about some of those other things. I so I want to talk about how we identify these, these groups of microbes. And so basically, if you, if you pull out an environmental sample, it literally contains tens of thousands of different microbes. You just start with that sample. And, and what we do is we passage it, we grow it with adding light and providing only CO2 and N2 as the sole carbon and nitrogen source. So the, the only way they can grow is by using sunlight and convert and, and, and fixing CO2 and N2. And you can grow that up. And if you just take a soil sample and you do that and you wait a few months, takes a little while, you'll get a dense culture. Now, if you take that out and you reset, re, re, reallocate that into another culture and grow that again, well, it grows a lot faster. And the number, different kinds of microbes actually change. They change dramatically, actually. And you keep doing that until you get what we call a stable culture that only has a few of those microbes with some dominant. Let me kind of show you how this works. This is the most complicated slide I'm gonna show you today. So on the x-axis, we call what each of our passages. So the first one is what is basically sequencing, and this is shotgun sequencing, not, not 16, that's full shotgun sequencing of the environmental sample. And then the second column is after one passage, and then we do it after two passages, three and four. So some things I wanna point, this is just two different strains that we're trying to show you. And I apologize, I'm not showing you the actual strain, the actual genus. That's, that's the difference between being an academic, but if this is industry, we can't share all this stuff. But if I was in academia, I'd show you all these things. And we talk all about how cool it was, the different strains we're finding, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do that. So, but if you look at strain one, it's almost, it doesn't, it almost doesn't exist in the population. But after one generation, it becomes very dominant. It becomes very stable in that population. Others, let's say strain 24, started at a pretty high rate, but then essentially disappear. So basically, these populations are changing pretty dramatically over time. Now, the important thing I want to show you here is in the last two columns, that population becomes absolutely stable. So after several months, if you keep growing it in the same condition, you get the same microbes. And that's critically important for making a product saying, I know what's going to be there, as well as for regulatory to say, we know what we're gonna see. And we see about 600 different organisms under these conditions, and they are very stable. In fact, you can measure that stability 
called the Bray Curtis Index. I won't go into detail what that is, but you can do that with your human microbiome and learn how stable that is. And we can tell you that our populations, no matter where we derived it from and how and when we derived it, are more stable than your personal microbiome. Your bi microbiome, which is considered very stable, is changing more than our populations that we're going to be putting out into the field. Okay, this just shows you that it's working. So what we have here is a plate. This is all in lab. We'll be doing our first tests uh, relatively soon, but it's in lab. And this is a 20 centimeter plate about eight or 10 inches across. And we just spray some of our microbes right on top. And then we look at reflectance at 680 nanometers and what you see that is red and you're really looking at the photosynthetic apparatus. And we're doing this at room temperature at about uh, 300 micro Einsteins. And so after five days at room temperatures, you see a little bit of growth there. But after 10 days, you see this whole plate. So you can see this after, after 10 days, you have a very dense culture on top of the soil. So we're showing that it grows quite well on top of the soil. And we're starting to do more, more and more experiments to say, how well does it grow? Can we measure it? Can we get the, can we uh, use uh, machine vision to, to measure how many microbes are there? Are there things besides photosynthetic machinery that we can capture? How do we measure nitrogen? We've done measuring this nitrogen under these conditions. And what we find of the biomass that's present there, 7% is nitrogen, 45% is carbon. So we can measure that. Now, what I'm going to show you here is basically two, two pieces. One of them is how easy this is to grow and how fast it is to grow, but also how we think about manufacturing. So what you're seeing in front of you is uh, this is growth at seven days at 400 micro Einsteins at room temperature. That's water with a few minerals added to it. And the only carbon and nitrogen are through those air hoses where we put filtered air through them. And you can see in seven days, we get a dense culture of these microbes. We call these photobioreactors. And what happens after, you know, so if you can imagine a billion of these, every square meter of soil in the world with microbes that can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And we can tell you we're pulling out, you know, right now this is milligrams, but if you start increasing the, the amount, this is grams of soil. And we believe we can pull about one and a half tons of CO2 per acre per year. That's how much we believe we can pull in, as well as 30 pounds of nitrogen reduced and into the soil. That is what we believe we can, we can do while we're doing that. Okay, um, I'll move on to, we, we're, I'll talk a little bit about crop protection here, because again, as I told you, the systematic way, we, we need to protect crops because, it, um, because the, the, the issue is there's avoidable CO2 equivalents that are made because 40% of all crops are lost to pests. So if we can protect crops using new, using new technologies and finding new chemistries, uh, we can do better in terms of uh, loss of uh, avoidance of CO2 equivalent loss to the atmosphere. So it, in, in the field of, of, of crop science, um, right now, the, the, one of the main ways they're protected is something called Bacillus thuringiensis. And there's a gene, set of genes that are taken out of this bacteria and put into the crops. And when, when you do that, and this is often called GM, genetically modified, um, the only thing that dies are the insects that are eating the crops. So, the, so only the, the pests that are eating the crops dies. And this has been a, a critical market for the last 25 years. It's uh, decreased the amount of chemistries, it's increased the amount of, of yields. And in fact, this is a this is a $20 billion market. This is a major, major market associated with, um, with agriculture right now. But the problem is insects are becoming resistant to the technology. Uh, it's very expensive to bring this because there's a high regulatory burden. And there are only so many modes of action from Bacillus thuringiensis. And so we're saying, what's the next BT, Bacillus thuringiensis? Are there more out there? There are a trillion species of microbes, only a, a hundred or so have ever been used in this space. There must be something else. And so we said, we believe we can find something else. And in fact, we did, in fact, in our pilot experiment, we found an organism that nobody had ever worked on associated with pesticides that enable uh, plant that, uh, that kill pests. So we found a novel molecule that will protect crops against uh, fall armyworm and other pests. And we can show the data right here. 
This is just a, a, a killing curve right there. And, and you can see the percent of mortality over the concentration of the pesticide. And we can tell you we found a novel chemistry, it's never been seen before associated with the pesticide. And now we've actually found multiple versions of those molecules. And we believe we can take this forward either as a natural chemistry from the original microbe or by making synthetic versions of this. And the idea is to continue to find novel chemistries looking at the diversity of microbiology. Okay, so that, just wanna talk about those two pieces. There's a third piece we're developing here. That's, that's even another way to think about this. And we call these carbon crops. So this starts with a professor at the University of, of California, and he was looking at aluminum resistance. Now, aluminum is, is in 50% of all arable land. It has a, a, a very negative impact in yield. And what you're seeing here is a map where it's high, where it's red, there's more aluminum, and where it's green, there's less aluminum, but that negatively impacts crops. And he was looking at plants that could be resistant to the aluminum, and he found some Arabidopsis plants. And, uh, and so he was looking at them, and what he found was three mutations. He found three plants, three different mutants that were all in the same gene. And it turns out, and you can see on the left, we call this a carbon crop. This is just a Arabidopsis, and they're growing in high aluminum. And you can see that on the left, control plants are, are negatively impacted, but the, the resistant plants grow quite well. And what we find is the gene that's impacted is something that takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, converts it into malate, which is a four carbon organic acid, and puts it into the soil. And by doing that, it sequesters aluminum and protects the plant, which is great. But what it also does is it acts as a funnel to take CO2 out of the atmosphere rapidly and put it into the soil as malate. And so we provided yet another way for, for biological methods to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, as well as identify ways to grow plants in areas where they have poor yield. And so we think about this in, in three different ways. One of them is these plants, we call carbon crops, can do massive soil carbon sequestration. We don't have all the data on this. We're still in relatively early days. We can also have improved crop plant efficiency where we can grow on aluminum crops where yields are getting hit. We can improve that. But it also turns out malate is critical in this, in this molecule or this enzyme, a critical for C4 photosynthesis. And malate is also the signaling molecule to bring microbes to nitrogen fixing plants. And so we expect that when you put this gene and it's a single gene that you can change by using CRISPR, we should we expect to see increases in C4 in yields for C4 plants as well as for legumes and other nitrogen fixing plants. Okay, so just to remind you, we have three different product lines. We have organisms that we call microbial cover crops and they do CO2 capture. We have chemistries we develop that do fall arming worm pesticides and they do CO2 avoidance. And we have carbon crops, which will generate by CRISPR and they also do CO2 capture. We, we are developing a pipeline for all these. The first of these we expect to hit the market. Um, and as Megan said, we have we raised about six and a half million dollars uh, one and a half years ago, about a year ago, I guess. And uh, to take these to market, we're of course going to need more resources to bring those forward. Looking for, so we've been looking for partners in terms of the big agricultural groups, as well as uh, groups that are interested in climate change to, um, to bring these forward. Um, now, I, we, we talk about our, our breakthroughs and, and we have some great investors, but a validation for what we did this up in the upper right, there was a, a challenge put out by a, by a venture capital group called Radical. And what they were looking for was groups that figured out novel ways to sequester carbon and improve soil health. There were 150 companies across or companies from 40 countries that applied for that challenge. And we won that in March, um, which was this, it was a, a huge, a very big deal in our space. And, uh, and we were very excited to be the winner of that. So we've been recognized both by our investors as well as by companies in international competitions. This is, uh, we have a great team here. Um, so so uh, I was the founder, I was the CEO and the CSO for a while, and I couldn't do both jobs. Steve Slater is, a, is an old uh, friend of mine and as well as a great scientist, and he took over as the CEO about a year ago. 
Uh, Elizabeth Gallegos has been involved with uh, startups and as a COO, as a chief operating officer, as a chief financial officer for uh, several startups, as well as Monsanto in agriculture. Uh, Kirk Narzinski is a, is a robotics expert and guru and an automation guru. But what really gets this going is, is Dr. Ann Gugesberg and Dr. Boima Otto Opong, and they lead our research and they make sure it gets going so that we, we are doing this in exactly the right way that, that uh, takes this forward. And it's these young scientists that really enable us to move this forward. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions and turn this over to Ajit. Sure, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Barry Goldman for that presentation on the experience and, and the innovations of Pluton Bio. So now is a great time for just a quick reminder to our audience, if you have questions or topics that you'd like to hear from our speakers on, please do contribute to the discussion using the Q&A function. We will be taking questions from there and also just um, opening up the discussion to, to wherever it leads us. So to moderate our discussion about technological innovation for soil carbon sequestration, joining us is Dr. Ajit Govind. Ajit is a broadly trained environmental physicist interested in studying various biophysical interactions on the Earth's surface. Currently, he is working as ICARDA Senior Climatologist and Systems Modeler based in Egypt. He is acting head of GeoAgro. At ICARDA, he is responsible for all climate research initiatives in the dryland context in MENA, Central Asia, and India. Welcome, Ajit. I'd love for you to start off this portion of the event by first, if you want to share some of your own reflections on, on soil carbon sequestrations and innovations in this area and the work of Pluton Bio that we all just heard about. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Megan. And uh, thanks, uh, Barry, for the fantastic presentation. I'm really impressed what microbiology could do in terms of climate mitigation. And uh, we, we have seen uh, microbiological progress and we know the uh, most of the biogeochemistry happening, but taking the, the, the body of knowledge on micro, uh, microbiology and uh, putting it to technological innovation that could mitigate climate change is quite phenomenal. And it's quite, I think it's uh, nascent and, uh, uh, it, and what uh, Pluton is doing is phenomenal. Uh, I congratulate you for the success and, uh, and also for the revolutionary works that you are doing. Uh, I'm very impressed about the three main directions of your um, of your company. First of all, to sequester carbon using microbial uh, organisms, and uh, uh, in this context, um, um, it is also exciting to note that it is not only sequestering carbon but also bringing in nitrogen to the atmosphere, uh, to the biosphere. So that has a big impact on. Uh, I, I would say both. Um, in terms of uh, enhancing the fertility of the soil, but at the same time, uh, making the situation conducive for uh, agri doing agriculture in a productive way, in a profitable way, but at the same time, without creating a lot of uh, impact on the climate. Um, because agriculture ha definitely, as you said, is one of the greatest contributor of uh, greenhouse gases, not only from, from a carbon, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, but also methane and the nitrous oxide. So uh, technology of this sort would be tremendous and uh, it will do a great uh, uh, impact on mitigating climate. And that's my observation. And secondly, about the use of uh, um, microbial technology to, um, to curb pests and diseases uh, using biotechnology, I, by uh, microbial insecticide, or uh, microbial insecticide is the right word, right? Yeah. So yeah. I remember my uh, undergraduate days when we were exposed to entomology and uh, I learned about this uh, fungus and uh, bacteria that could uh, be used as uh, pesticide. So it's, uh, it's good to recollect those things and also, but, but what it really uh, means to the environment is uh, being nature friendly at the same time, um, reducing the pollution because a lot of these uh, pesticides and uh, insecticides have a lot of heavy metals like manganese and uh, arsenic, and that has a big impact on not only the, the it's in terms of climate. Is we are normally uh, focusing mostly on climate change, but also the issue of pollution, environmental pollution, is not much given attention and. 
this technology could play a great role in reducing the environmental impact in terms of pollution through the use of uh, pest and diseases, but at the same time be nature friendly. Um, so that's fantastic. And uh, and the third one is uh, quite uh, very, very, I'm pleasantly surprised about the the new revolution in, in carbon sequestration. We have been always looking into the issue of carbon sequestration only from a, from a, a photosynthesis respiration balance point of view. And if you see a positive um, effect on this balance, that means if the, if the uh, photosynthesis is more than respiratory losses, then we assume that the system is sequestering carbon. But uh, I, we never ever thought about other mechanisms of uh, mm -hmm. carbon sequestration, other biogeochemistry. So the mallet chemistry is very, very exciting. And uh, I, I think uh, with these uh, statements, I would uh, invite questions from my audience. Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, there, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and uh, are, uh, I think already there's one question in the chat box. Um, are you going to read Megan or should I read it out? You can go ahead and take the questions that you thank you. Okay. So there's uh, um, one question from Adisu Dulsh. Dulasha Gobana. Um, so uh, he's asking, I'm wondering if these products may have effect on soil microbes population diversity. Other, yeah, so, yeah, I think uh, uh, there's a competition between different microbes. Yeah, so we're going off of like what the data from human microbiomes, right? Where you where you add a specific organisms and then almost very rapid, it might do a function and then rapidly. The, the mass of organisms that are there take over. So when you look at the total population, so, so we don't think so. Again, until you do something in the field, you really don't know, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So when, when you look at the overall amount of microbes, there's roughly 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight microbes. And we're gonna be putting out about 10 to the three, like one in 10,000. <coughs> Excuse me, I should have water here and I don't. Um, and, uh, and so what we think will happen just from the data that we've seen from complex microbiomes is this will take over under the seasons that we're growing it. And then as winter hits, as, as things freeze, as the, as the environment takes over, these will then dissipate and will be taken over by the rest of the population. You can see the major organism that we have, a photosynthetic organism, virtually will disappear after a few months. It will grow well for a few months and then essentially will drop off. So we don't think that it will. So that's kind of one answer. The second answer is on fields that are that are massively done with corn on corn on corn or corn soy. The amount of diversity that's in those fields is dramatically reduced. It is dramatically reduced. And as a consequence, so if you look at, at fields that are right next to the Midwest soils and you go to the, the original prairie right next to it, it is literally a thousand X more diverse than the corn fields. And that's, that's not surprising. You have, instead of the complexity and all the plants and all the animals and microbes and everything, you have basically a same system. So we actually think by putting more carbon and nitrogen, it'll be like regenerative ag. And that we will increase the overall diversity of the soil because now more carbon and more nitrogen are gonna be available in different forms for new organisms. And so, we actually believe we will see an increase in biodiversity by putting these microbes into the field. And so while you start with microbes, eventually they die, they'll be degraded into biomass and other long-term carbon. And we already know we're finding uh, carotenoids and other long with carbon species that it will actually increase the diversity of the soil. Now, again, until we test, we don't know, but that is what we think we will see. Thank you, Barry. Um... I have one question. I mean, you mentioned in the first technology that uh, the the new novel microbes are bringing in uh, carbon from the atmosphere to the biosphere by the process of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, the, the other possibility of carbon sequestration is these microbes reduce the respiration losses. Now, your, your technology is mostly focused on bringing in uh, photosynthetic carbon to the biosphere. And uh, 
and this how my question is how this uh, um, carbonate or how this uh, carbohydrate that is coming into the biosphere is different from the carbohydrate or the the organic matter uh, carbohydrate or in other words how uh, what will be the difference in the carbon that is sequestered by this type of technology relative to the natural carbon sequestration? Is there a yeah. difference in the quality of the, of the- Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we, we, we know what we think. I mean, we know what we've pr proposed. Uh, and again, until we test, we don't, you know, you won't see, we won't know. Um, these, these organisms secrete extra polymeric substances, uh, it, usually in the form of complex carbohydrates. In addition, they secrete at least carotenoids, and we think we're seeing other long-lived molecules as well. So by doing that, we, we believe it's really different than, than the standard uh, carbon and, and, and turnover. We think that some of these are going to be long-lived enough that it will take a while to turn them over, and so that they will be increasing soil organic carbon by putting more complex carbons, particularly in... Um, so if you think about a biocrust, which is really what we modeled, what we were doing on... Biocrust can be relatively long lived and they can put a lot of carbon into the soil. And the reason they're crust is because of these extra polymeric substances, which al allow it to form a layer, which actually protects water from leaving those soils. And so we think that that's a little bit different than what we're seeing. And again, what we're looking for is a quick hit. In two months, we'll see a lot of increase in carbon and nitrogen. And then of course, winter will hit and then we'll go back to, you know, it'll go back to, to what's normally regenerated. And then we believe you'll have to apply this for at least three or four years, maybe five years to kind of increase that soil organic carbon from, and we're looking at very low SOC soils as opposed to Midwest, you know, you know, in Iowa, you probably, there's probably, it's gonna be tough to increase the amount of soil organic carbon in Iowa, but in Kansas, that's, that's certainly a possibility. So we're focusing on regions where they have low soil organic carbon so we can really increase that difference and, and do that by putting in more complex carbon sources. So, be, be, and because of, of how we did the selections, we don't believe it's about respiration, although I, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, um, because we're asking them to grow from, from basic CO2 and N2 subunits. So we're not asking them, to, we're not slowing down respiration as much as taking those and, and building them up. Now, there's a possibility we're taking respiration intermediates and integrating it, but, uh, and in fact, that might be some of the other microbes we're seeing in the process because we don't understand what all the different microbes are doing. Megan, do you want to take the next question? Sure, so we have a, a few questions here from an attendee. Um, the first one is, can we find the same soil microbes in a hydroponics system? And they go on to ask if they can be as interesting as soil microbes in terms of CO2 fixation. Yeah, so that's a great question. So hydroponic systems tend to not have as many, ha have as much diversity as, uh, as uh, soil microbes. So, in a, in a, so it's assumed that there's roughly in a rich uh, soil system, there will be 10,000 different species of microbes. In a hydroponic system, you know, you're looking at closer to a thousand um, and, and the microbes are there. Now that said, I've never done those selections. So I don't know if you'd find the same microbes or not. Um, if those microbes are present, you should be able to find them in a hydroponic system. But again, I don't know. I've never done those selections. You're starting from a reduced uh, diversity environment, so it's possible you wouldn't be able to to find them. But it's also possible that you know, um, you know, we don't know enough about that to tell you. It may, maybe they'll work just fine. I personally have a question um, about. Uh, I mean, where this I mean, in the, the experiments where this uh, I mean, the experiments were done basically in the Midwest, right? And mm -hmm. how how well or what what are your you know, thoughts on how this will perform in other regions of the world, especially the region where I'm coming from? It's um, in Middle East and North Africa, which is predominantly dry and uh, very low in organic carbon. So, do you think this technology can enhance carbon in the MENA dry region? Yeah, so the short answer is yes. And, and we're approaching this in, in three different ways. Uh, so so we're, we're thinking about that immediately because, you know, great, you can help the Midwest, US, but what about the rest of the world? Because at the end of the day, we want this on as many acres as possible to, be, to really be pulling in that gigaton of carbon 
over the world. Um, so way number one is, you know, we'll test. We'll, we'll say, okay, here's our microbes. Can we do that? Number two is we've done experiments now with soil from all over the U.S. And the reason we do that is just uh, so we're not dealing with treaties and regulations and things like that by taking soil from somewhere else. But we've collected from all over the U.S. a distance of about 25 hundred miles, uh, what is that, roughly 5,000 or 4,000 kilometers or so. And we're seeing basically the same organisms. We sequenced all of them, we've sequenced, done about 100 experiments, we're seeing basically the same organisms each and every time, which suggests that there's a, there's a core component to what's happening. The third thing, the plan is, 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 what, is because it only takes us six months to develop a product line, is that we're just gonna go to those regions and it take, it'll take three years to get the export of our products in the U.S. to someplace like France or to Egypt or to Australia. It's easier for us to go to France or Egypt or Australia and select the organisms from those, those regions to, to sign all the regulatory agreements and say, let's get an Egyptian version of this. Let's get, let's get an, uh, a, French, a French version of this. Let's get an Australian version, a Brazilian version. It won't be that hard to do that to get the same thing because we know the process we need to develop them and we know what markers we're looking for and what phenotypes we're looking for to get there. So if you know the process and, and that's what we've patented is the process, then we can get to that no matter what our system is and we believe that will work in every system. So while we think that one system kind of works everywhere, we will still test and figure out if is that, is that really true. And uh... I, I personally think that um, the you can also, I mean, looking into other other biogeochemical mechanisms like nitrous oxide emission because mm -hmm. of uh, denitrification bacteria and uh, and also the methanogenesis bacteria. These are uh, mostly found in rice, I mean, uh, rice paddy fields where yeah, uh, which overlaps with Southeast Asia mostly, where major the 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 largest population density is. And uh, so develop some technologies, not only from carbon sequestration from a CO2 perspective, but also the um, greenhouse gas emission, reducing the greenhouse gas emission by curbing um, nitrous oxide emission, for example. You know, that's yeah, no, a very powerful greenhouse gas. Yeah, and we've been thinking about that as well. Uh, we, we think that might be a different kind of selection given the rice patties. We were thinking about can you ask microbes to use that methane or methane uh, and, and N2O uh, as nitrogen or as carbon sources? Can you do, can you run those reactions, probably a different set of microbes, but can you run those reactions where you can essentially add that to rice patties to reduce that and put more nutrients instead of being lost to the atmosphere, can we recycle those more effectively? That is, can we give the rice patties a jump start? that enables them to, to not lose those greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And, and uh, given the potency of those two greenhouse gases, uh, you know, methane and nitrous oxide, I mean, they're, they're you know, 200 plus more active as greenhouse gases than, than CO2, even if they are shorter lived. And if there are ways to, to reduce them and put more nutrients back in the soil, that might be a very powerful thing to be able to do. We have not done that. Those experiments, we've certainly been thinking about them. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and call in a question that we received in the chat. And this is sort of shifting gears a little bit more to the scaling side of things. So mm -hmm. this uh, attendee is asking about business models that might make these products accessible for farmers in low and middle income countries. So this is certainly a salient topic when we think about you know, scaling these innovations for sustainable development. So thinking about how we can increase accessibility for, for farmers in low and middle income contexts. Yeah, that's a great question. So we're trying to get our costs down right now at to roughly eight eight dollars uh, per acre uh, of full in cost. The way we see that you would make that back is through carbon credits. So right now, companies like Indigo are paying growers fifteen dollars per acre per ton of carbon. If we can hit the ton and a half of CO two, that would roughly generate twenty two twenty three dollars per acre per grower. If you subtract the $8 from that, then they would be making $15 per acre in a shoulder season. So not in the standard season, but actually making more money outside of what they've already been doing. So that's one model. The second model is they can decrease their inputs. If we can put 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre and it's costing 
growers now 20, uh, about 81 cents or 80 cents will do for, for simple math, uh, times the 30 pounds, that's really $24 of savings they would get by not having to put those 30 pounds of nitrogen. So the total savings when you put those two together is roughly $40 per acre. So we think by coming in at such a low cost that we can do that. In terms of scaling, why we think we can do this is about 14 or 15 years ago, um, everybody thought that they could grow algae in open ponds to make biofuels. A lot of those ponds are still there. We're basically doing the same thing. We're putting water with a few minerals in open ponds and letting sunlight and CO2 and N2 grow them. So our scaling, right now we're doing everything in the lab, but the scaling is essentially to go into these raceways and grow a lot of it. Now, I'll, I'll make sure you understand the scale of this. To grow, for, for our calculations, to grow enough to cover all of the United States would take about 10% of Arizona. Now, Arizona is a big state and that's a lot, but we could cover the entire United States with microbes that would be pulling out in our estimation close to 400 million tons of CO2 equivalents out of the atmosphere and putting in close to a billion tons of N2, reduced N2 in the form of ammonia, glutamine, et cetera, into the soil. So we think, again, that's big thinking. We're, we're kind of at the, you draw three little bullet points, you make a graph and you draw three little bullet points down at the edge and then you extrapolate it all the way to the end and see, aha, it worked. Um, we know that's not true. We know we have so much work to do to get there. But that's how we're thinking about it, that, that if we can think about this in a big way and say, what do we really need to put organisms like this everywhere? And to be clear, this doesn't solve climate change. We still have to move off of greenhouse gases. We still have to, to mitigate. We still have to move to um, every way we can to stop carbon but we've got to slow this down. We've got to slow this change down and this would allow us to slow the change down. And can we, we can be out in the field in two years. We can start doing this very, very soon and scale this quickly in a biological system. It would go. It would work with, with the physical systems, with the, with the conventional systems that everybody's thinking about. This is just one more solution. This isn't the answer, but this isn't the golden ticket. This is one way to help the world. And we believe we'll help farmers as well. Great. Have you also thought about uh, uh, venturing into the ocean domain? Because that's also a very big part of the Earth. Yeah. And uh, microbes uh, in the ocean uh, is uh, still an area that could be um, exploited in terms of uh, carbon sequestration. And I think uh, our um, technology has not ventured much into the ocean domain. To yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a great, I mean, it's a great idea. Um, yeah, so, so I can tell you, I was on a panel for Mon when I worked for Monsanto, we were looking at climate change, this is in 2006, and we were trying to think about how climate change was going to impact us as a company, how it was going to impact the world, and we were trying to think, is there a way we can use this, and somebody had the idea, said, well, you could add iron, so this is not a microbial solution, but you could add iron to the atmosphere, of course, it would cause blooms, because nitrogen is limiting in, 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 in most uh, ocean systems and that would pull CO2, they'd sink to the bottom and that would be CO2 sequestration. And somebody did that experiment, which, which horrified everybody because they didn't do a pilot. They just went and dumped literally tons and ton or pounds and pounds of, of iron into the, into the, uh, into the um, ocean. So we have not figured out how to approach that because delivery, scaling, currents. We, so we don't know how to approach that yet. I mean, that's, that's, that's a huge, I mean, Yes, it's there. The nutrients are there. There's a lot of reasons to think ocean would be great. Um, my background is in agriculture, and so I've been focusing on agriculture, and that's still big enough. But I, I absolutely agree. Oceans and what you can find there would be quite large, but it also has um, you know, some serious risks associated with it, and, and a lot of thought has to be done. And, and I'm not going to dismiss the risks that we're that we are thinking about for what we are trying to do in terms of, of what impacts on the soil that we're going to create. Over to you, Megan. Yeah, great. These are these are really good, uh, you know, reflections and observations, and and just to sort of continue on this path of talking about scaling, I think it's interesting to consider um, 
how you know partnerships play a role in scaling. And I know that you've been collaborating with Bayer on, on this uh, uh, carbon capture amendment and, and this discussion opening up with CJR as well. So if you wanna speak a little bit to how uh, partnerships might affect your scaling process and, and uh, go a bit into that. Yeah, thank you. Um, they're critical, um, <laughs> that's all we can say. We are a little company, we're 16 people. Um, we, we, and we don't uh, have access to salespeople and, and, and directly to growers. We, we, we have access to a few growers and they can test our stuff. We get feedback from them, how well it's working. Uh, we can get thoughts about what, the, why they see this as a good product or a bad product, but that's not delivering it rapidly to, to lots of, lots of people. And so companies like, like Bayer, uh, and, and the other, what are called the strategic Syngenta, Corteva, et cetera, uh, uh, NGOs like CGAIR um, give, can give you access to scale and to grow and to learn in ways that we as a small company just can't possibly do it. And, and we know this has to be a partnership. We know that we can provide some pieces to this. We have some ideas and we have some initial uh, things we've produced, but the feedback, the, the production, the, all the other pieces that we need, we have to work with others to, to get there. Um, you know, that, that's really what we see is that you can, and, and, we'll, and we'll, we're happy to work with anybody to figure out how to solve this. And, and just a little reflection on myself. Um, I, I have four kids uh, and I, I, I didn't have to do this, right? I mean, I could have done something else. I could have been a, you know, a scientist with another company and, and you know, done that for the rest of my career. I, I want them to grow in a world that isn't going to be impinged by climate change. So this is personal for me, as it as it is for everybody. You want to see your children and 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 your and humans and your humankind do better in this world. And so for Steve and I, this is a mission for us. How do we make a difference in this world? And how do we use what we know and what technologies we develop to make a difference in this world? And and we do that through partnerships with whomever we can to make it happen. I think that's that's a really great. Uh point is that, you know, climate change is personal for all of us and especially for, for um, you know, certain populations and, and areas of the world that are, are more vulnerable. It's, it's especially important to get these technologies and innovations and, and sustainably develop. So um, on, on a positive note, I'd love to hear if you've, you've experienced any already positive social and environmental impacts from, from developing your innovation and what you see of the, the outcomes and benefits of scaling this. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you that. I mean, we it, it, right now it's we're very small, and so it's a lot of it is theoretical. You know, very early in the space. Um, I do get um, when I've presented, I do get a lot of comments, for, especially from venture capitals, that say, "Wow, I hope you succeed." Now that doesn't mean they invest in us, but they do want us all to succeed. And it's just like, yeah, you can help us succeed by by investing in us and helping us do this. But um, you know, that's that's just kind of how it works. Um, but but a lot of people commenting that that you know they they see the value and they see the importance of it uh, and and taking a different look. One of the the biggest um, one of the, one of the judges on the paddle for for the radical challenge is uh, is a seed producer, one of the biggest seed producers in the world. So an, an individual who owns the company, and I sat down at dinner with him, and he he had a great comment that I thought was the the best feedback I ever heard, which was. I don't know that what you're doing is going to work. And, and let's be clear, we don't know it is either. I mean, we, we think it is, but that doesn't mean it's we're right. He goes, I don't know what's going to work, but you're making people think differently about carbon and about their field by realizing they don't have to put plants in the field, that microbes can do the same jobs as plants, as, other, as, as physical systems. And by bringing up this idea and, and promoting it, maybe the next group comes in and they've got a slightly better idea and they, maybe we only take it so far, right? Maybe you only take it to midfield to use a football metaphor. Maybe you need an, a, a different group to bring in and actually score the goal, right? That might be the case, but if that's what we've done, that's great, right? That's, that's, that will be enough. That's great. And, and I think just a, another question, having, having been there since the beginning as a founder of, of mm -hmm. Pluton, and what can you uh, give as a lesson or maybe uh, one piece of advice for, for taking uh, an innovation from the earliest stages from a research idea and really making that leap into taking it into the market? Do you have any, 
any reflections on that for our audience today? Yeah, I'd say it's a balance between absolutely believing in what you're doing, but always listening to feedback. Because you've got to be absolutely convinced in what you're doing. On the other hand, you have to constantly listen to hear what it is you're doing. And, and, and you know, you might have a, a great idea, but if you don't say it correctly, then nobody's interested. If you say something great, but you don't have, it's, there's no depth or science behind it, then it can only go so far. And so how do you listen to the smartest people in the world that are not in the room with you and continually hear what they have to say as well, but, but still believing and, and staying focused on that long-term vision to solve it. I have a one uh, question for you. What is the background or what is the uh, motivation with the name Pluton? It's more of a, uh -huh. a physics-based uh, name, but yeah. there's some anecdote you can share with us. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Pluton is, is, uh, is uh, sort of a, a change in, the, in Pluto, which is the god of mining. It was the, oh, it, yeah. the Roman god of mining, was Pluto, which is also geology based, right? So it was the, the god of mining. That is, we are mining the, the earth for microbes to do new things, to do, to do things that we, nobody had anticipated to solve big problems. And it gets back to the, if you can imagine it, a microbe already solves it, right? Which is also this idea, you know, some of the things you talked about, while we're trying to do carbon and nitrogen, that doesn't mean we can't be adding things that, that solubilize phosphate and that remove arsenic and that we can, can't be adding to these to keep improving what we're doing to solve each of the problems that are for a localized environment and to keep mining microbes to do novel things. Great. That's great. And it's really expansive and the opportunities truly are are just growing. And so we're we're so thrilled to to hear about Pluton and all of the work. And, and thank you again, Barry, and thank you, Ajit, for, for contributing to this discussion. It looks like we're just about out of time for our event here today. And I think that's, that's a really great note to wrap up on. So though our discussion here on Zoom has come to a close, we want to encourage everyone watching to keep the conversation open and uh, more collaboration and connection like this between science and venture actors can spur innovation, allowing for food systems impact to be fully realized like through carbon sequestration technologies as we talked about today. So on behalf of the Accelerate for Impact platform team that put this event together, we want to say thank you to all who came to be a part of it. The A4IP aims to connect scientific products to the market and excite demand for CJR science. A4IP strives to play a catalytic role between research and development entrepreneurs who want to be the drivers of transformative change by developing high impact, multidisciplinary science-based technologies, solutions, and enterprises that will make our food systems healthier, equitable, and sustainable. So we invite you to join us in this mission and stay tuned to all of the programming coming out of A4IP. Reach out to us at innovations at cjr.org. Thanks again to our speakers, Barry and Ajit, to our colleagues at CJR who helped us organize, and of course, to our audience of scientists and innovators. We look forward to seeing you for the next Venture Out event just around the corner. So thanks and see you next time.